The topic of interest, Amy, uh, good day, everybody. Dr. McGuire, Amy McGuire at Mercy. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. I was jumping the gun there for a second. A hot topic is the term early admit when we're talking college admissions. Amy, what does that mean? Early admit. Yeah, that's, I mean, I just, like we said, it's the time of year there. People, parents are getting this. They're excited. Yes. Um, but I won't rain in your parade. You tell me what that means. Yeah, no, no. I, I mean, so I wanted to start by saying um, there's three types of admissions criteria. Like there's three timelines for admissions, essentially. So students can apply to institutions in early action, right? Early decision or rolling admissions. So many institutions have rolling admissions. Typically, that means once you complete your application, like um, complete the application, get in your transcripts, SAT, whatever the requirements of your institution are, they try to get you an admissions decision pretty quickly. Like there's no delay necessarily. There's no big release timeline. It might be 10 days. It might be two weeks, whatever it is. But they're going to be doing it on a continuous process, hence rolling. For early action... Most of the time they have an early deadline, right? Like November, maybe December, depending on the institution. But with early action, most of the time when students are applying under that umbrella, it means that's their number one choice, right? If they get accepted, that's where they're going. And the the impression of the institution is that if they say yes, then the student is going to say yes. So there is a commitment process when you go in early action and you apply early action. You're saying, I'm completing this ap application full well knowing that if I get in, this is where I'm going. There is a caveat to that about like finances, like if your finances don't work out or financially this becomes burdensome, you know, every institution is a little bit different. But as a generality, if you apply early action, that's where you'll go if you get in. If you apply early decision, and this is where some of these topics come in, right, that we're going to talk about today, is you are applying early, you're getting a, a decision earlier, right? So those students that apply are applying in November, early action, maybe they're getting a decision before Christmas break. If you're applying early decision, maybe you're getting your decisions about now, right? The early part of March, maybe end of February to say... You've been accepted, you've been waitlisted, you've been deferred for another term, another semester. Um, but if you're interested in coming, it, you know that this is like in your top five institutions that you would want to go to. So it's not necessarily rolling admissions where maybe those are your, I wouldn't necessarily call them safety schools, but like you know that you're going to get in and you want to have them kind of in your back pocket to say, I'm in fantastic, at least I know I have a place that I'm going to go in the fall. Early action, number one, if I get in, that's where I want to go. And then early decision is I want to get a decision earlier, but mm -hmm. I don't want to commit right away, um, like in that early action phase. So that's where this wait list defer, like some of this language starts to come in, is in that middle section normally. Yeah, this seems like one big game. It kind of is. I mean, it's it's both for the student and the institution, right? So we're constantly at the institutions trying to predict what our what our class is going to look like. So if sure. you're applying early action, we're essentially thinking, okay, these 50 students, we're they're coming. You know, we can anticipate at least 50 students in our class, right? So it is sort of like a numbers game that we're all working towards, but because institutions more often than not, and this is going to be a whole nother, maybe this is a whole nother topic we talk about, um, institutions are trying to set their budget and all of those things as it relates to the students who are enrolling in their institutions, they're trying to set themselves up for some more predictable outcomes. Um, and so that's where that early action um, and early decision comes in a little bit more. Yeah, that makes sense. I think a lot of people need to understand the, the, the institutional side of it too, right? Everything you said with the business. Um, but that aside, I think it's like buying a car or any big purchase. It's that mindset the parents and their student student has <laughs> whatever that means. Um, yeah. Where do you think the parent? Where where are parents and students getting jammed up? Because I see a lot of chatter that they are beside themselves um, in that they, in their mind, 
applied and they expect because they did early you know all those terms that you just said yeah, i'm yeah. just trying to play, i'm just trying to play the outsider here um yeah. they get their 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 notice that they're on the wait list right and they think what the heck so where where do you think lies the miscommunication um if any from parent to school yeah so just because you applied early doesn't mean that you're guaranteed a spot Right. And that's the first thing. Just because you applied early doesn't mean that you um, that you got a spot. So if you're applying early, you're essentially trying to hedge. Right. You're saying, I want to make sure that I'm in the top of the read. So some institutions do like um, a committee read where a bunch of people get together and they're evaluating applications and, and they're doing that in a sort of a systematic way. Right. And if you apply early, you're saying, I want to be in the forefront of that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but just because you apply early doesn't necessarily mean that you're guaranteed a spot. Also, it could depend on the school that you're applying to. So some um, schools like within the university, so the School of Nursing, School of Engineering, whatever, some of those schools have caps on how many students that they can take in new. And sometimes it's based on how many students are graduating. So if you're waitlisted, that might mean we anticipate 30 students are going to graduate and we're going to have 30 spots left, but we might have 35. And so you're in that five that are, you know, is next up if we have the space. So sometimes it's a capacity situation. Um, and I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because this is one of the questions that you have that letter of continue that letter of continued interest, right? If it's a capacity, you can ask, right? Is this a capacity? Like, you don't have enough spots. That's where that letter of continued interest, like that floats you to the top maybe of the wait list, right? Well, hang on, we're, we're, we're going to get to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but that's, that's where some of that comes into play. So some of the wait list is about capacity and space, not at the institution, but within the program that you're actually looking at studying. Right. So from, from, what, I under, from what I understand, this is common. Yes. The whole process is common. Yes. It's super me, common. And for the most competitive, yeah, for the most competitive institutions, you know, and to put perspective, you know, to put this in perspective, um, you know, there are institutions who are getting 5,000 applications for 100 spots. Right. And wow. so, you know, it's a, it's a lot. And the committees are trying to read and say, this is the best member of our community. This is the best GPA. This is the best. That's why those essays and resumes and all of those things are so important to look at a holistic review, right? Is to say, yeah. I'm going to be the best member of your community. I'm going to be the best member in your school and I'm the brightest, right? So it's all of those things combined. But yeah, I mean, at the most competitive institutions and some of the most competitive programs, a wait list is pretty, you know, it's pretty common for sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I, this is crazy. Parents will say either to themselves or the school, well, what are my chances? <laughs> I'm on the wait list. So what are my chances? Yeah. What do you say? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's yeah. the hardest question we get, right? That's the hardest question that institutions that have wait lists get. Um, you know, I, I, it's hard to anticipate that, right? Again, it's hard to predict because a lot of what we do in enrollment management and higher education is try to predict human behavior, right? So you might be on the wait list and somebody ahead of you might say, oh, you know what? I got an early action at this other institution that now I'm going to commit to. And then that moves you. So all that um, that anyone can give you is a really, really rough estimate. Um, so I I don't want to say it in this way, but that's a tough question to answer. You sure. likely are not going to get a 100% truthful answer that you could hang your hat on. Um, so in the meantime, I, I would um, suggest to a family, have that backup plan, you know, hang out on the wait list if that's where you know you want to be, but make sure that you have a, you know, a secondary option just in case. Yeah. Does the institution tell the parent and student? why they're on the wait list? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, because the, the again, the reason may vary, you know? Um, you it, Again, it may be a capacity thing. Um, you may be the least qualified of the applicants, if we're being really honest, right? That doesn't mean that you're 
not qualified. It just means that you're the least qualified. Um, you know, you're 30 out of 29 spots. Um, and so all of those things are, are reasonable options. So sometimes institutions are a little bit more vague um, and they just say, you're on the wait list and we'll be in touch with you once we, you know, once we're able to get you off the wait list, if we're able to get you off the wait list. Interesting. So how long should one wait for that school to make their decision? Yeah, often they are giving, institutions are giving the people ahead, like who've been accepted, they're giving them a deadline. Okay. So um, I encourage students, you know, I know that May 1st is still a soft, you know, deadline of um, National Decision Day used to be, you have to make your admissions decision by May 1st. Um, but I still use that as a soft deadline for students. You know, you mm -hmm. should feel confident going into graduation, knowing where you want to go, right? And if if it is financially reasonable for you and your family, maybe it's worthwhile to put down a deposit and say, I'm, I'm still going to wait out this other and see if I can, you know, can afford two deposits or I'm going to put a deposit down, but I'm going to, you know, keep collecting money in case, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to keep saving in case I get that, um, that deposit because it's, it's non-refundable for most institutions, but you know, you should feel confident as a student and as a parent to know where you want to go. Um, mm -hmm. because that anxiety over the summer, it messes up your summer break. It messes up your vacations and, um, you're constantly looking at your email instead of like having fun down the shore. <laughs> yes is 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 their financial package involved in this at all yeah so sometimes it is um and i would i would say financial aid is always going to be um, a driver of the decision that you that students and families are making right so no matter what as you move through this process whether you're on the wait list whether you're accepted early decision you know whatever as soon as you receive that offer letter, uh, that financial aid offer letter, you should immediately reach out to your counselor and say, or the financial aid office and say, I want to make sure that I fully understand this. Because again, if I'm going to hang out on the wait list, I want to make sure that this is an affordable option for us. If it's not, then I'm not going to stay on the wait list. Yeah, you know, that, I, makes, that makes sense. You know, th exactly. Then it makes it a little easier to make those decisions. Um, and if if for whatever reason, and this shouldn't necessarily be the case, they're not going to send you a financial aid package until you are accepted into the program, right? Then it may be worthwhile for you to reach out to the financial aid office and say, is there a general studies program that I could be accepted in? If that's the case, can I go that way? What does it look like for me to transition into then the school that I'm interested in for business or whatever? If I take a year in you know, here we call it university studies, um, you know, whatever it is, I want to be in the institution. And then what does it look like for me to transition into the program after one year and then look at costs from there? Because there are likely more spots in a general education program than in the engineering school or in the business school or whatever. And your admissions counselor may be more honest with you to say, you know, when I look at the wait list, Mm, you may be better off to, to start here. If this institution is where you want to be, and that's where the student and family really needs to think, like if this is where you want to get your degree from, then consider that general space and then be really intentional about what does it look like to transfer in one year? How many students are getting into the program in one year? Because you don't want to spin your wheels either and then be behind in your program, spending more time at the institution, and then your financial aid, you know, continues on further than that. You end up in that six-year cohort instead of the four-year cohort. I love that idea of pivoting and seeing what other programs you can go into to get in. I love that idea. I never thought of that. Yeah. And, you know, we have students here, you know, health professions at Gwinnett is a big deal, right? And so we get a lot of students who are like, I'm interested in nursing. I'm interested in nursing. I'm interested in nursing. Great. We want to make sure that you're admissible to the nursing program. But have you thought about public health since I read in your essay that you get sick at the sight of blood or, you know, whatever those sorts of things. And that's your counselor is usually your admissions counselor is usually a really good person to talk through some of those things with you because they're going to have great ideas on programming. So they're going to be able to say, 
you know, maybe not accounting, but what about management? Like, have you thought about that? Have you thought about this? Um, where do you want to be? What sort of job do you think you want to be in? And then you can talk about other options. If that institution is, you're like, I have to be at Gwen and Mercy. Okay, let's talk about how we can get you at Gwen and Mercy and get you in a, into a career and a job that really makes good sense for you, where you're going to be happy and you're going to be fulfilled and all of those things and get that degree in four years. Perfect. Now we're going to segue into, we're still on the wait list. Um, we need some tools in our arsenal to market ourselves. Yes. And it is called the L-O-C-I. Yes. What does that stand for? And what does it mean? Yeah, the LOCI is the letter of continued interest. And essentially, it's something that um, students use in lots of different ways, right? Um, but it's to essentially say, I recognize that I'm on the wait list, but I'm still super interested in your program. And here's what should bring me to the top of the wait list more or less. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a way for you to really highlight your achievements. Maybe you're highlighting some um, connectivity with the institution. Maybe it's connectivity with um, the program itself to say, you know, I had the opportunity to blah, 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 or I was involved in XYZ camp that you hosted, whatever the case is. Maybe something that you forgot to put in your application that maybe you could have that would have, you know, put you, bumped you up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but it also allows, um, it, it allows students to reshare in a different capacity that, even though I'm on the wait list, I'm still really interested. Like that has not deterred me from wanting to be at the institution because more often than not, we get ghosted by students <laughs> because now they're on the wait list and they're like, oh, well, you know, I'm no, I'm, I'm no longer interested, but then I never tell you that I'm not interested. Their feelings are. Yeah, their feelings are, and rightfully so, right? Like this is an emotional decision that we're making. Um, but the the LOCI, the letter of continued interest, allows students to say, I'm still interested. Who who and sees that letter? Usually the whoever is on the admissions committee who is um evaluating the applications. So as they're thinking about who to pull off the wait list, it's something additional that we would put in your file or that the, the admissions office would put in your file to say, hey, program director or dean or whoever's reviewing this file again for who to, to bring into the class, here's an additional piece of information that I got from this student that is on top of their transcript and resume and all of those other things. At what point should this letter be submitted um, after you got the, I'm on the waiting list? Yeah, um, I would usually give it a few weeks because more more often than not, there are some students that shift around their ideas of where they want to go in the months of March and April. You know, they're making those final decisions. They're putting their deposits in, those sorts of things. Um, so I usually encourage students, like, give it a few weeks. You don't have to be right there. You might find yourself off the wait list anyway. Um, uh, and, and I'm a fan, and I know our students are fans, right, of doing the least amount of work. Right. I'm a fan of that too, 100%. Um, but that at least gives you an opportunity to then communicate on all of the other things that we just talked about, right? Um, does the financial aid still work for you? Are there other programs that might that might interest you at that same institution? Whatever. It allows you to explore all of those avenues and then come back and say, you know what? I've done all of that. This is still exactly where I want to be. I'm now educated on the entire process and it's exactly here that I want to be. So usually a few, a few weeks, I would say, you know, three or four weeks. Okay. Okay. So for those of those, for everybody who may be joining, um, Amy from Gwen at Mercy, gmercy.edu. If you yep. want to check out all the cool programs that you have available. Amy, last question. Um, what strategies would you give parents at this point, based on what we talked about, to wrap everything up if we, if they are on the wait list? Yes. So the the top thing that I would do, and I'm I'm just a fan of this anyway, have a plan B just in case, right? Whether that plan B is another institution or another school at the current institution that you're looking at, just have a backup plan. You're going to feel better. Your students are going to feel better. Your pocketbook's going to feel better as you're thinking about the financial piece of it as well. So it doesn't necessarily have to be, oh, no, I'm not going to be at this school. Look at the other options at the institution 
um, and have a backup plan at another institution if that's something that makes you comfortable. Um, but don't feel like the the first and only option is to move away from it. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I hate to say be patient, but be patient. Um, it, it's the hardest part of the whole thing. Be patient. I know. I know. It's the hardest part of this whole thing. Um, it truly is. But the other thing is keep those lines of communication open with the admissions counselor. The person that you've been working with this whole time, they have the best sense of who you are. They're typically advocating for you on the inside, right? So they are your advocate within the committee, like on those different things. So just keep in touch with them. And if at any point you decide that's not the place you want to be. Just let them know. Because um, that'll be really helpful then for the person who's stressing right behind you. Yeah. But do they, though? That's like paying it forward. I don't know about that. They I should. know. Yeah. Yeah. At what point um, can a parent or a student be too overbearing to the institution? No, not no, really. But... Not really. I mean, I'm I'm used to getting emails regularly <laughs> from students and parents. Um, so no, no, no. I mean, I think that the that you know, again, being patient is is the tough part. But if you want to communicate with me every single day and say any update, any update, any update, any update, that's fine. As long as you're okay, if I respond, no update yet, no update yet, no update yet, no update yet. Right. Sure. So I think it's it's more about setting the expectations for yourself. And for the counselor, um, because I may say, you know, it's going to be two weeks before they review it again. Mm -hmm. right? So if you email me every day for two weeks, I'm not going to have an update. <laughs> but if you set a reminder on your calendar to say, oh, she said two weeks from today, which is the, you know, whatever date that is, I'm going to send her a follow up email on that date. Then it'll be like, oh, OK, yes, I have some information for you. Or you email me at 8 a.m. The meeting's at 1 p.m. So <laughs> you know, I can at least yeah. give you something at that. Point. Sure, sure. Hey, why stop at plan B? What about C and D? Oh my gosh, C, D, E, F, G. I'm happy with multiple plans. I mean, yeah. at, at the end of the day, you you hold a lot of power. I think that families, parents and families feel like they're really powerless in this process. And honestly, you're not. But um, why do they feel that way? Because they feel like we are making all of the decisions, I think. The, we're deciding the future of whatever they're going to do. And, and I really think that reclaiming that and saying, no problem, I have a plan B. No problem, I have a plan C. No problem, I have a plan whatever. That empowers you, right, as the student and the family to say, oh, I don't have to be floating out here in the ether, right, and saying, I have no idea what I'm going to do now. But it's to sit down and say, okay, I've looked at all the financial aid packages. I have a top three or I have a top four. And I'm on the wait list for two of them, but I know that the other two I'm in because I did rolling in missions. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm feeling confident about that. And I don't feel like I'm losing anything by going to institution three and four. That's the other thing. You don't necessarily need to settle either, right? So ask, so what if I start a community college? What does transferring in look like? What What are all of these options? You have so many options um, as the parent and as the student, right, to ask these questions that really you should feel like you hold some power and some agency in this process. And I know it feels overwhelming and I know it feels like, like Amy doesn't care. She's just making the decision. She doesn't care about who I am as a person. We mm -hmm. really do. Um, we we want to make sure that you're getting the best experience no matter what. Um, but sometimes the news is not good. Um, and so we want to work with you and say, okay, what are your other options? If you want to end up here, let's talk about what it looks like in a different way. Maybe it's a more mm -hmm. circular path as opposed to a straight on. Do, do families do themselves a disservice by not having these other plans in, in place? I think so. It's easy to lose hope. Um, you know, it, it's easy to get to, to start to get to the end of the year, your senior year. Right. And I remember this even when I, a long time ago, right. When I was a senior and you started to hear, I got into X institution and I got X scholarship and I got blah, blah, blah. And you're hearing maybe your friends and maybe you're hearing your colleagues and people are asking you, right. Like your family members are saying, Oh, well, where are you going to go? And for you to feel like overwhelmed by that. Um, so I do think that sometimes it gets to feel so overwhelming that you're like, I'm not going to make a decision. 
So, but mm -hmm. no decision is a decision. So for you to say, I'm not going to make a decision. It's the same as saying no. Is yeah. Yeah. Um, so to have that plan B, C, D, E, however many you feel comfortable with, um, is always going to be like, it's going to make you feel better. I've, and, and to be, um, honest, right. I got on the wait list of X institution. And if I don't get in, I plan on going to Y and I'm really excited about the opportunity to still, you know, pursue my degree in X. Um, so to still take a positive thought process through that whole thing, as soon as you stop feeling positive, that's when everything starts to feel more challenging, more overwhelming, more negative. Totally makes sense. All right, families, there you go. The whole wait list tutorial wrapped up in a nutshell. Amy from when at Mercy University, gmercy.edu. If yep. you have any questions, they have any questions, Amy? We can reach out to you. Holler at me. Happy to have him. All right. Till next time. Thank you. Bye.